Hello everyone. Hello and thank you. Thank you for coming to this meeting. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, I have uh, the pleasure of introducing uh, my colleague, uh, Bill Borgen, who's going to be giving a 35 to 40 minutes talk on his vision uh, for the department. And, um, and I'll tell you a little, most of you know Bill very well. Uh, several of you have worked with him for many years. But for those of you who don't know him, well, um, I have gathered some information about him. Uh, Bill um, is a professor of counseling psychology and head of uh, the educational and counseling psychology and special education. Uh, he was appointed to this position in 2008 and is now being uh, reviewed for extension for the next two years. Bill has been at UBC for a, a, a long time, since 1976. He was initially appointed as a 12-month lecturer in the Counseling Psychology Program and as an assistant professor starting in 1977. He became an associate professor and head of the Department of Counseling Psychology in 1982. And he was the head of CNPS until 1994. I didn't do the math for 12 years. Um, Bill has um, a distinguished um, and extensive um, scholarly career. He has conducted research and has developed programs in the area of life transitions and career development for several years. He's a registered psychologist in D.C. and Alberta, and his work has been translated and adapted for use in Bhutan, Denmark, Finland, Hungary, and Sweden. Bill was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Umea in Sweden for his leadership in the development of counselor education in Sweden. There's a whole list of um, uh, Bill's uh, accomplishments with respect to leadership in the field, but for the sake of time, I'm going to stop here and turn it over to Bill to give us his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming today. I wanted to start off the presentation talking about having visions to mean a number of things. Um, I think in this case, what I've done is look at the department with respect to the Faculty of Education Strategic Plan and to see where, where we might, might go with respect to that. Not just that, but including this as well, because this is one of our major contexts. I'd like to begin with a little bit of a contextual statement. Our context of the department is we are in a research-intensive university. We've heard that a lot. And I think within the department, one of the issues that has arisen is how do we develop an infrastructure to actually make that alive and workable within the work that we're doing in the department. We're also working within a context of revised budget situation. We move from historical budgeting to uh, tuition-based budgeting to some hybrid now, and 
As I mentioned at the department meeting, there's some discussion about devolving more responsibility for budgetary decisions within departments. And I think that that will have an implication for how we move forward and the kind of dialogue that needs to happen within the department to do that in a fair and equitable way. In terms of what I would like to focus on that are three very important uh, groups in our department, students, faculty, and staff, just as some other contextual information. This I put in, a, in the uh, renewal document in January, but it highlights who we have. We have 456 graduate students in the department, and they're spread out, as you can see, somewhat differently across the programs, and I think what's really important is to see this spread, the 99, 120, and the 237. The PhD MA group, in terms of research supervision, that's a direct part of our, our workload. That's a lot of students. And they're not necessarily completely equally distributed across. So that, that can be an issue. We also have a great number of MN students, so we're serving a professional and academic need, uh, I think, very well, given the resources that we have. Graduate and undergraduate courses, you can see 872 credits in total, and you see the grad and undergrad breakdown. We got some information yesterday, and I, I don't think we can compare it completely at, at the DAC meeting. Um, Rita and uh, Jennifer presented some material from the, from the TEO, Jennifer Stewart, and at that show that we had 165 credits in the TEO program, the ed program, but I'm not sure they were using the same year breakdown, so I'm not sure it's fair to say that that's what it is. But we, we have a lot of involvement in the teacher education program, as well as undergrad outside teacher education, as well as obviously the graduate area. What do we have to bring to do all that in terms of faculty and staff? We have 41 tenure track individuals in the department. And just a bit of contextual information with respect to the faculty on that. The next size department is Ed Studies with 33, Ed CP with 32, and LLED with 29, and the School of Connects 26, with a total of 161. So we Bigger isn't better, it's just contextual in terms of the number of uh, faculty resources we have to, to bring to the kind of work that we have to do. Appointments without review. We have six and a half individuals who are appointed uh, not in tenure track positions. They are, they are two year positions, 12 month lectures, term appointments, for, and you can see that spreads not evenly across the areas, but every area has some appointment in that, in, in, of that type. Sessional appointments. We are reducing the sessional economy. We are still have 70 people teaching 360 credits across the department. <laughs> Part of that is also influenced by our heavy involvement in PDCE uh, in online programs. Those are, that, that proportion is probably quite high in those ones. I brought this up because it came out of the DAC yesterday um, in the presentation that Rita and Jennifer made. If you look at the percentage of, of ECPS courses taught in the teacher ed program in 2011 and who was teaching them, you can see quite a dramatic change in a couple of areas. The percentage of sessional appointments in 2011 was 38.3 and 2012 was 20.8. So that has, that has gone down quite significantly, quite a bit there. And the involvement of TAs has gone up, as has the involvement of 12-month lecturers. So it's, there's a movement in that, in that involvement to have greater TA involvement and more full-time involvement of people who are more connected with the programs. Rita has said that this is starting to, sh to sh uh, make a great deal of difference in the nature of, of how those teacher edu programs are offered and the kind of feel that the program has to have more full-time people involved in them, in the courses. New hires for this coming year. We already hired 
Allison Cloth as an assistant professor in school psych, Dr. Uh, Rachel Weber, um, also in school psych. We, are, we have an ad out currently for an assistant professor in special education, because Marion Porath is going to leave us in this capacity at the end of June. Um, have a 12-month uh, lecture ads out in both MERM and HCLC, and as I said at the department meeting, we have been authorized to resume the search for the CRC2 chair in Aboriginal mental health and wellness and education. Staff. We have six staff members. I mention them because, in many ways, they're the oil in our engine that help us do what we do. They're a vital part of, of what we're able to accomplish, and we've had some turnover in that area. I think it's solidifying again now, and I think we have a very good team. The leadership team. I mentioned this group because we are a large, diverse department. We have five major graduate uh, program areas with subdivisions within. I, as department head, have found this group to be increasingly partnering in the decision making and involvement. A good example of that was over the fall, as you know, we were wondering about strategic planning, how much work to do on that, how far it was going within the faculty, and whether it was a good way to spend our time. And in January, we needed to read a faculty renewal plan. That would not have happened in the way that it did without the hard work of the, the coordinators, the other people on the council, and the members of the areas who contributed, I think, to a pretty good document in terms of making the case for the hiring we need over the next five years. <coughs> Possible futures for ECPS. Augmented support, I think we will have a development, it's emerging already, of some very key and strategic research centers in the department. I think that these will lead to elevating the excellence that we have already, and in many ways open, open some new doors to the kind of funding we get. And it also, this one with augmented support, we have to look to see what support we're going to need to pull that off. We already have some centers operating and emerging. We have some faculty members who are just starting to work together in new and creative ways that I think will lead to these type of centers. And I think it will really help to solidify and, and create new opportunities for working together that maybe we haven't had before. Now, when I say center, I, I think we need to think about this in a way that's perhaps slightly different in the sense that sometimes center means I'm doing this, I'm the one who's known about it. I think the more we can collaborate, the more that we can do this from different perspectives within the centers, it expands the funding range that we can get and also probably more adequately addresses some of the complex issues that we're, we're trying to address. Teaching and learning. I had to make notes on this because there's too much happening for me to remember. Program quality. I have never worked with a group of people who are so committed to the quality of what they're doing. And the level of engagement, I think, is outstanding in the different areas to ensure that continues. And I think we'll have to work together to see how we not only maintain that, but have it grow more. Again, with infrastructure support, the online and distance programs continue and expand. For example, MERM is considering um, they want to have a colloquium and classroom assessment in the fall, have an advertisement out for a 12-month lecture in that area, and maybe want to get some courses going through PDCE to open to teachers as a way to en enhance capacity in the province in that area. School psychology, in com combination with special education, is looking at putting on a francophone cohort for school psychologists in preparation of school psychologists at the master's level had a meeting, uh, Marion and I had a meeting with Tom Sork yesterday talking about a certificate in high ability within special education that would in, increase capacity in that area. 
counseling psychology and special education continue with the cohorts in um, in at the master's level. HDLC is considering something in combination, maybe with Spad or some others, maybe with Merm, and. We have counseling psychology and special education have indicated an interest in the education minor that's being proposed at the, at the undergrad level. So a number of ways I think we're assisting in what we need to do here cognitively, cognately. It also helps to diversify the admissions um, at the undergrad level and at the grad level, which also is, is in connect, it connects well with the budgetary lines that we're going forward with. Um, I'm very pleased that Jenna got the graduate student organization up and running this year, and I think that will make a difference to the students' lives. I think, and I'll say more about this later, but I think it enhances the connections across programs and builds a greater sense of community among the students. We heard that they're planning a bourbon and bingo night tonight <laughs> for everybody in the department, so hopefully that goes well. <laughs> In terms of community engagement, I believe in our department, for a number of us, community engagement informs the scholarly activity, teaching, and service components. It's not just about service. It's about knowledge translation. It's also about what we learn from working with professional members of the community. And I think there's a good symbiotic relationship there. Um, I think it also forms the basis for partnership grants uh, from a number of funding agencies. I think a number of, of people in the department are positioned to move in that area now, and I think given our reputation and the quality of what we do, that that will continue and expand. Aboriginal engagement. This is an area where people have been working, I think, individually. It's an area that I think we need to give more prominence to in terms of coalescing what, what, what we're doing and making it more visible. We have Rod McCormick, who's been uh, working very hard in that area in the department. And I, when we consolidate and hire somebody into this CRT2 chair, I think that will be catalytic to bring this together in another way there. Much more work to be done in this area, I believe. Alumni engagement. The department currently has six tenure track positions people who have been hired as a result of community-based funding. That's, that's, I think, a very good record, and it speaks to the credibility in the community of the work that we do as a department, and also helps us extend what we're doing. I think that there is room for more of this probably happening in the future, and I think it's probably a way that we will have to think about not going out and marketing ourselves in that way, but positioning ourselves to have those discussions with possible funders. And then I think, in terms of alumni engagement, we're at the beginning stages now with the student organization, but I don't see why not, why we couldn't uh, move this forward into looking to develop an ECPS chapter of the Alumni Association, if that solidifies more, which then connects the students here also with the students who have graduated from our department. International engagement. When I first came into the position, people said, we don't have the infrastructure for that. We're too busy doing what we're doing now. It's, it's kind of the sense I got. There seems to be more of an infrastructure, I think, with Tom Sort taking that on. There's more of a process for how these can be, things, things uh, can be processed. And um, I think there also, the infrastructure is causing people who are interested in that to stop and think of the questions they need to have answers to before they go forward. And there are, I think there's some, this is, this is something that will evolve as people want it to, but I think that people are positioning themselves now. We've had three indications of interest from uh, outside international, um, for international connection and support. And um, we're, there are some meetings being held to investigate it. So I think that's an area that's starting to emerge. We'll see how it develops. A standing work environment. For me, this is always a work in progress. This is something that I think the respectful environment has helped us to focus on. 
I think it requires infrastructure support so that we have the support to do the work we're doing. And it also requires and assumes a respect for each other. It doesn't mean we can't disagree. It's how we do it that I think determines the nature of the work environment. Sustainability. I think this fits us well. A major aim in the department is to promote educational, social, and personal sustainability of individuals and groups, many of whom have a history of marginalization. We're not always involved in that, but it's a, it captures a fair bit about what we're doing. I think a major role for the department had is to help create an infrastructure and work environment that promotes sustainability of programs, faculty members, students, and staff. I think when we talk about sustainability, we talk about the physical environment. That's really important. It's also important the kind of environment we have as a working group in order to promote our own sustainability so we can continue with what we're doing. One of the challenges I find as a university professor, and I see it in my colleagues, is that we have a lot of freedom to decide how we spend our time. And some people are better at that than others. Some of us get overcommitted and then have to pull back for a while and get orient oriented again. But in my, in my experience, it's a life, it's a career long um, balance. But I think it's important that we continue. It always bothers me when we're, if we get into situations where things are running because somebody's doing something more than they should be doing. I think you can do that for a while, but I don't think it's a thing. I think that's something we have to be careful of. One of my goals, I guess, in, in the time I've been department head is to look at programs and to say, do you have the infrastructure to port to make your program sustainable? Are, are the faculty members getting enough time to do what they need to do to make the programs work in a way that isn't taking far more time than it should. Ponderosa Commons. Scarf Building is benefiting from upgrades to get more in line with the new building. I think that's one point. And I think it'll be interesting to see how we can not only contribute, but benefit from the new space. That was me trying to look at where we might think we might be going within the context of the faculty of education strategic plan. Those points were the, were the bullet, major bullet points within the faculty event strategic plan. I have a couple of more issues I'd like to raise in that regard, however, around our three areas. Around faculty, I think the department will continue to adjust the balance across tenure track, short term positions, and continue to reduce reliance on part time sessionals. The amount of work it was taking us, we had 70 people appointed this past this year, we probably had doubled that a couple of years ago. The number of peer reviews that you had to conduct, the number of meetings it took when things weren't going well, I think that kind of, the, number, the amount of staff time it took to have all the appointments go through, I think that will really help us think about what that balance should be. And I think we're going in the right direction with it. And I, I would suggest that we'll probably get more faculty appointments through outside funding as we move forward. Staff, staff designations need to be adjusted. When we're looking at the level of complexity of what we're doing and the number of people we have, we need to recognize the work that's done. And I don't think what we have right now in terms of the staff levels and designations will match as we go forward what we need the staff to do. I don't mean radically changing. I need some tweaking, though. If we're looking at, at increased infrastructure for grant support, do we have enough staff time doing that? Looking at what the office manager 
we'll, we'll be doing if we devolve budgets with HR concerns and financial concerns. I don't think the level we have for the office manager fits that right now. So I think that's something we'll need to address, and I, I certainly feel the support of the dean in looking at that. So it, it's not a, a big problem. I think it's just something we need to anticipate. The students, I, I see a strong allegiance to programs and good sense of connection with them, and a developing sense of departmental connection. And, and I think what Jenna's work this past year, some of us we've done together, but you spearheaded, I think is, is a way to try to get that going and also make it sustainable. This is the first year we've had student representatives at the department meeting because it's the first year we've had an organization where a student coming to the department meeting was representing a larger group. And they're taking turns, and I think, I think the, the feedback I've had so far is that the uh, kind of information they're getting from coming is very valuable for them. When I was asked to consider being department head in 2008, I gave a short talk, something like this. And at that time, I had something called intentions of the head, and I thought I'd look back at that to see if it was still relevant. <laughs> to see if I'd done any of it. <laughs> I guess. Um, and I remove obstacles that impede quality of the work, faculty, students, and staff. I think a lot of my time goes in that. I've, I've tried to work with an open door policy. If my door is closed, it usually means that I have a tight deadline and I'm using voice recognition software to get something into the computer quickly and I don't want people to think I'm sitting there talking to myself. <laughs> close the door. And people have come in, raised issues with me. Um, so a fair bit of time is spent on that kind of activity and I think it's time well spent. Maintain systems and processes to promote the quality of work. Well, that's, let's remove obstacles. This one is how can you be additive? How can you work at maintaining? And that seems to me, given the rates of change we've been going through, moving from part-time sessional to other economies, for example, the, the hiring we've been doing, that also is a, is a level of involvement that is pretty intense. And then trying to maintain a steady course. Uh, in terms of based on departmental goals and priorities. There's lots of ways to spend time. It's a matter of how, you, how I can set priorities with my time, work with the council, focusing on what we need to do to go forward, which means that not everything is number one. Some things have to, to wait until we get to it. Duties at the head. Consolidation. We're going to hear more about this, I think, as we talk about budgets. We've had it We've had it before. How do we consolidate what we're doing in ways that are more economically efficient and cognitively defensible? And I think that that's something with our large programs, some of which have to have small, small section numbers, small section sizes in order to be credible. That means we're expensive in some ways, and we need to be. We, we have to keep in, in mind ways to consolidate what we're doing, where the opportunities are there. Management, a fair bit of that, just in terms of, um, I don't know how many things I sign in a week. <laughs> For example, the HSS grants have been up this past week, and, and things that only show if you don't do them. <laughs> in a lot of ways. Innovation. I think it's really important in changing times, which we're obviously living in, to be aware of opportunities. One of the things I have really appreciated is people coming in with ideas and say, have you thought of that, or should we try that? There seems to be a spirit of, when people come in with ideas that are new, I think it's my job to see if that can be made possible. I also, sitting in my office, can think sometimes, well, have we, can we try it this way? So then I bring it to the council. The council brings it to you, or we have it in the department meeting. And I, I found a really good sense of, of, of communication uh, both ways in that regard. Uh, 
actions at the head. Staying connected and providing a broader perspective. One of the things that I had to realize when I came into the headship in 2008 is that I didn't have to have a very broad perspective. I could focus on what I needed, and or if I was coordinating counseling site, what area needed. One of the things that deans always remind heads of is that they are they need to have their perspective of the whole faculty. And I need to, as a department head, have to have that and also have to have the perspective of the whole department. And I think that staying connected, staying connected with you, staying connected with the dean's office and broader outside areas is very important. And that's something that if I, if I didn't do that, I don't think I could do, do my job very well at all. Supporting, obviously for what the needs of faculty members, staff, and students are, major role, and challenging sometimes. Can we, can we think of this? Have we thought of that? Um, some, and often you challenging me. And I think the extent to which that can go both ways, we get, we had, we get a better result leaving egos aside. <laughs> I have to take as much time as I thought. Thank you very much. <laughs>
looking forward, when you talk about removing obstacles for faculty so that we can better do our job, what do you see as the biggest obstacles and what would be your plan in the next couple of years to remove some of those obstacles? One of the things I was told when I first came in in 2008 that was there was not enough support for grants. I approached the dean at that point. We got enough money to hire a half-time person for two years um, to help in grant development. We, I also, I'm giving the context for this, I, I, also, I also was told there wasn't enough help for grant management around accounts. And I haven't heard that as much. I, what, what I've tried to do there is get more dedicated staff time to help in that area. I think as we want to move forward, I think I, I have asked already for a grant person uh, to be in the department part time. Not that we only we should have it, but, and Bly, when I tossed with her about that, said, well, what if that was available for the whole, all departments, fine, but it's more support in that area. As we go that way, I don't think we have adequate support in the account area then if we ratchet up another notch. So that would be one example in the, in the um, research scholarly activity area that I've been working on. I think I put that in the, in the uh, more elaborated part that I wrote about uh, on the headship. But that's, that's a strategic area that if in a research intensive university, if we want people to, to um, be PIs, principal investigators, for large collaborative grants, what kind of infrastructure do we have to have for that? And then how do we build it? And we clearly need, I think, some other resources in the department, as well as what OGPR is doing, to have that kind of seamless kind of service. So that would be one example. I have a question. Sorry to following up, but I just wanted to make sure that I understand what you're saying. Because I think about new faculty members, and both we have some new faculty, and we're talking about faculty renewal. And you know, to me, one of the critical aspects of being a new faculty member years ago. Um, is the mentorship and support we provide so that they come into the department and have that. So what, you know, I, I'm not as aware of what's currently um, going on and what would be your vision, given especially that we're going to have a lot of new faculty positions in the next couple of years. I think we're going to have to ramp that up. I think we're going to have to make it more formal in terms of getting mentors attached to people. When we've been hiring people recently, they been coming into programs that are pretty focused, and and there are people within those programs who are working with them. But I think we need to, as we get more and more younger faculty, newer faculty members, we'll have to make that more formal, make it very clear to them in terms of what the expectations are to being successful, and then try to create an infrastructure around them to help support them in that. But I'm. I think otherwise we're, we're not being fair to them given the, given the expectations that we have at the university. Shall I? I continue on that. Um, this was an issue, uh, first of all, Bill, I have very much appreciated what you've done in the last few years trying to take on this department, and I certainly know, having sat in that chair, how complicated it is and how diverse our faculty is. But there's some problems that were raised in the two years that I was in the position that still are not addressed. One that I think is a real issue, and um, I think that we have never faced it. By your numbers, we have 456 graduate students, and we have 41 full-time faculty that can supervise. If it's distributed evenly, which it never is, it's 11 students per faculty member. How does that make any sense in a research-intensive university? I, for one, tell myself all the time, oh, I'm doing pretty good considering all the students I have. We shouldn't be doing that. So there has been, to my knowledge, no movement to make any effort to either reduce graduate students or to increase faculty that can supervise, aside from funding coming from the outside. And I don't feel that there's been a real push to change that in any way, shape, or form. We're hiring more people to teach. We're not hiring more people to promote our research. And I think that's a major problem. And do you have ideas of how to address that? in the coming couple of years. Right. One of the, one of the uh, issues I pointed out on that slide with a number of PhD and MA students particularly, mm -hmm. who uh, the MED students are handed variously. Some are in, are in um, course only. Some have the 590, the well, they portfolio. Well, 590. Yeah. And so m what I've been saying, well, what I needed to do was get, we were 
economically floating for a couple of years. Where we didn't quite know what the lay of the land would be in terms of our budget, how, how much that was tied to student enrollment, all of that. I think it's much clearer now. What I've been saying to programs, and I think School Site was one that reduced its intake the year before last because of faculty availability. I've been saying other programs who aren't as used to operating with quotas don't admit more than you can handle. We haven't formalized that yet. I've been saying it in the council. One of the things that, that Colin Sharwood is talking about from the CFO, perhaps we, we, we look at reducing our intakes well, if, from a financial point of view, seeing how that works with our resources available. I think it's a very important issue that we need to address. And you're, I have not taken the step of saying to areas, you can't admit more than this because of the people you have to address it. That's something that I, that's, it's an area, I'm not sure that I can, I would say that right now, but it's an area where we need to investigate more and get it much more, I agree with you. But I raised this in 2008 as well. well we, and I still feel that there's not a cap on it and there's not equal distribution. And I think we're doing a disservice to our students. And I see nothing. There's not been a limit on how many people students you can take. And that's offset by the fact that we have to have so many students to maintain our max, the minimum number of students per course so we have to let in a cohort. There's an area with four major faculty members and you have to let in eight to ten students every year. Guess what? We're going to be over that number. And I just see no progress at all in addressing that problem, and I think it continues to be a major one. When, we, when you raised this in the department meeting, I think the year before last, we did a count, brought it to the area, to the, to the council, and there, didn't, there didn't, wasn't a general feeling for what you're saying in terms of it being across all areas. Where we have some quite small programs that do need students to make them run, as you said. We have some others who have set quotas according to their according to their staff or faculty availability, and others that maybe still have to do that. And that's something that needs more attention. I don't disagree with you. Yeah. Right. Thanks a lot for your written documents and your presentation today, Bill. Um, I was just reflecting last night over the question that I might want to ask, and I was I feel like I'm channeling my inner Peter Crocker, who I've been on a few <laughs> search committees with, and he's quite eloquent in, in being very direct about things, and I feel like when he's done that, it's really generated some nice discussion, so I'm just going to be direct. I guess for me, my question is, and I don't know that I understand this, it's kind of a two-part, and it's to sort of stir a little passion in you, perhaps. Um, why do you want to do this for two more years, <laughs> is one, and... Um, and, again, and I don't mean this to sound maybe as harsh as it does, but um, you're here, and, and you've told us this thing, and it kind of kicks into the specifics. You know, why do you want to do it, and why should we have you continue for two more years? I mean, what might continue that's going well? What might look a little different? I think Peter usually says, why do you want to be here, and why should we hire you? You know, So I think it's a variation of that for somebody that's in-house. So that's my question. That's your question. I think it's fair to ask who would want to do this. <laughs> For me, it's been an inductive process. I was slated to go on sabbatical in 2008, and I was asked by the dean to consider being department head. And so I saw myself going this direction. A month later, I was going in this direction. And so I agreed to a three-year term because I wanted to see given the, our diversity, given the complexity that certainly what Shelley has described, whether I wanted to take it on. The interest I have in it is I like to work with systems. I like to, it doesn't matter, a, a lot of what happens, and people who know in these areas, you can, you can work to foster things behind the scenes, and it doesn't really matter from me, if anybody knows that I've been involved in that, I like the involvement. Uh, at times, yeah, I can say, yes, I've done that. And sometimes it's public, sometimes it isn't. I find working with systems, trying to make them better, trying to make them more human, is, that's, it's, it's been an ongoing career interest of mine. Some of this position has that. <laughs> <laughs> Some of it in the management area is you just have to keep doing it. 
um, in order for things to run, and that's that's a given with most jobs. But that would be one of the that would be one of the reasons. And and at this particular juncture, with Bly coming in, I think our department uh, is very well positioned within his vision for the faculty of education. We had a bit of a pause between deans, which. Had, it was hard to get some forward movement and some infrastructure things. That's starting to happen now. I think with the faculty renewal, giving it another couple of years, some of that will be more consolidated. Um, and I think it might be, make some sense to have some continuity and leadership over that period. So that would be a partial answer, I guess, to your second question. I have a question. Uh, maybe it uh, builds on the other side, what Laurie asked. Uh, what do you... What do you want from us? Because I think being a head of department is not a great job, frankly. I don't know why Carla Reed, she asked, why would you really want this? Because I think... I don't think I had that intonation. <laughs> 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 She's right, but I have an intonation. I think the, like someone once said, if you're a dean too long, you risk having a psychiatric disorder. <laughs> uh, and, or if you're a head of department, you can also sort of like, you can drive you nuts. How long's too long? <laughs> No, I see too long, but I actually think administrators sometimes um, need to be asked, what do you want from us? Because I think being a head or a dean or administrator, I'm convinced you, I believe you, most of the time you act in the interests of others a lot. Uh, except when I, when I go and ask for things that I don't get in my way. But, <laughs> but why, what do you want from us? Like, if you're going to consider this for two years, I think it's a two-way question. Like, you could say, I don't know if I want to do it. So I am mean, picking up, and it's kind of what she's asking. But I want to go for it. What do you want from us? You're if you, if you take this job. <laughs> I, I think I can do my work when I engage with you well, when you engage with me well, when you, when you um, come and, and let me know what you need. As you say, it's not always possible. <laughs> no. Sometimes it is. Um, and also to challenge. To, I, I, I mean, I think the, da the danger of sometimes having a position with, with line authority to it is people tend to, could tend to tell you what you want to hear. I don't think that's useful. I don't think that happens very much. <laughs> but, but I think that we're better when we have diverse perspectives coming in. And we, respect, we don't necessarily always have to agree, but I think we have to listen to them. And I think that, when I feel like I've got that coming back, I feel more secure that I'm going for I, You can't lead a parade of one as a department head. In, ma in many ways, I can be as effective as the cooperation. I don't mean agreement. I mean the engagement I have with people in the department as well as outside the department and outside the faculty. So I guess for me it would be engagement and, and connection. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for, for stepping forward and, and uh, answering questions in this presentation. I, I uh, have two questions. I'll tell you what they are generally first, and then I'll, I'll get into it. One has to do with, uh, uh, and both of them are long-standing questions. One has to do with the department, its history, um, and a very Canadian question of, you know, federalism versus provincial um, in Southern, in the various senses of the word provincial, if we wish. Uh, and the second one is on your observation, which I think you're right, and, and like you, I'm a little alarmed by it, that a lot of the hiring in the future may be driven by outside minds. So let me ask you the first question. Um, the, 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 the history of the department, for those who are not a member of it, um, is really, a, a recent history is really a result of at least, at least three shotgun weddings. Um, at site to special ed, yeah, the three. It's debated three versus four, but, um, but the big ones, which alarmed, which were very large, were the historical one of Ed Site and Special Ed, and then after that, the CNPS to the Ed Site Special Ed to this thing called the ECPS. Um, and the question is, do we, we exist? And there's there's a lot of synergy, and at the same time, there's a lot of sort of going in different directions. How do we bring together the whole while representing each of the areas? I mean, I affiliate to my discipline. Uh, there is no discipline called ECPS. It doesn't exist. 
There's no journals of that because there's, no, there's none of these things. There's no conferences of that. There's none of these things that I see. Like there's in psychology and mathematics, yeah. which is a mathematician. That's why, I mean, I, I identify more as a mathematician than an egg pusser. So I, 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 I don't, I, so I'm really struggling. Do you know what I mean? We, professional identity. I mean, how do we do this? And better still, forget about the history. How, what do you see over the next two years? This is only two years of what we're talking about here. What do you see over the next two years that we can, you know, how do we come together and yet respect the general? To, to me, that's been an ongoing <coughs> inside my head. Also, working with the council, I think people are affiliated with their disciplines. We're a multidisciplinary department. Mm -hmm. Within a very large container, we're, con we're connected. But you have to go at quite a high level before we find those connections. So when somebody said, what's your department about, I thought, well, we're about the study of diversity within the context of inclusion. And if I get much more narrow than that, I leave somebody out. Yeah. And, and so uh, that's very general. What I've seen is, and, is that in building the areas, I'm seeing, I think, more willingness to connect, more comfort with one another, coming from a base that they're feeling perhaps more secure about the support they have for their programs. But it's an ongoing tension. I mean, I think the discussion we had at the department meeting about shortening department meetings to an hour and having a presentation for, uh, from somebody in the department to bring that sense of collegiality, as well as academic and cognate input, is a really good move in the overall direction. I'm hoping, I see, uh, and this is me talking, not me for it as a, as a, this is me talking as, in my own academic head, not as, as head. Um, I think there's areas where we can have programmatic connections that we haven't looked at. I think that where some of our fields are going, we have gaps in some areas that other areas are addressing with slightly different lens that we can, we can start doing some of that um, more, more specifically together. But I think it's an ongoing discussion. I see respect across areas. I think if the budgets devolve and we get enough money so that if two, two full professors retire, three can be hired, three assistants can be hired if we made that decision, then we can start looking across at who can help who, but that sort of thing. So it's not just about me and my area. That brings to my second question I mentioned, which is, and thank you. Um, uh, my second question has to do with this hiring, and you and I have had this conversation before, so we may as well have it publicly here. Uh, I, and I know you share some of this, I find, I find it very alarming that the, that the hires, tenure-track hires, mm -hmm. are being driven by, uh, by these sort of momentary funds that are coming around. Topic A has become very important, socially relevant, we're, we're able to leverage that, and all of a sudden we have a position in that area. Lovely, and that's fantastic in some ways, but in other ways, it ignores that, we, that there's a lot of areas which we need where that might not happen. So how do we guarantee that we don't become something that we never planned to become because all we're relying on is this very accidental funding? And it's accidental. I mean, let's be frank. A topic becomes hot for a variety of, of you know, synergistic ideas that are outside of here. Sometimes they're driven by us. My, one of my colleagues sitting next to me has been 25 years pushing for a particular agenda item. It's come up big. Marv has, it's come up big, so Marv is able to, to leverage some funding out of that. Right. But often, it's, it's other reasons. So how are we going to do this, Bill? And how are we going to forgive, uh, it's not to offend the deans in the room, but how are we going to hold the dean's feet to the fire on um, you know, making sure that we get the next appointment in a particular area of special education or a particular area of HDLC? Uh, that is not leveraged that is a community accidental funding. I think one of the things that we have to be cognizant of is that when we get funding from a funder, they have an idea of what they would like to see done. That doesn't mean that's all we have to do. The, the, in fact, in fact, I think there are more pressures from the dean's level of the university to broaden out the position. So I think, I think what you're saying is something we have to watch for, and I think there's a trend going the other way of saying, let's do the specific work, but let's embed it within a broader knowledge base. That, that will serve more than one need, because otherwise we're simply reactive to, to what's going on and doesn't plan. I think we can, we can also be susceptible to that when we're doing faculty renewal. The, the person who retires, and I, I think what we're finding is, as this goes forward, people are retiring at the top of their field. They're, 
in the, in the main. They know what, what, what they're up to date. It doesn't mean the person we hire has to have exactly that skill set. Maybe, maybe it's that and something else. Or maybe it, it broadens out. So I, I think, again, it's a balance of, of how we get the, the specific deep knowledge we need in an area and broaden it out in a way that the, the department forms uh, in a sense it will matter. So we don't have these isolated uh, flavor of the day. Like, I think it's a really important area. One last, what is your highest priority in the next two years? One high priority? One, number one. I think the faculty renewal and how we go about that and how we do it with respect. And I, I think the, the areas and the, and the council have done that very well up to now. I very much appreciated the partnership that I felt in getting stuff together. And I think as funding shifts and as priorities shift, that will be a living document and we'll have to just keep that sense of, of collaboration and our own opinions uh, uh, in, in, in making it strong. Thank you. And thank you. The time is up. Thank you all for attending and for your great questions. And please join me in thanking the Welcome to remind you that there are feedback forms here. You can also do them online, but if you'd like to get one here,